You are Locked On Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Locked on Lakers for Thursday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. Um, some fun stuff to cover today, kind of bouncing around a little bit. We're going to open up the mailbag a little to talk uh, postseason awards and what the Lakers might be available, what might have available to them next year. Uh, Jeannie Buss uh, spoke to The Athletic, um, had some interesting things to say there. But Andy... This may, we joke a lot about like, you know, how much athletes pay attention. Like, why do they, you know, what do they care about? What are they not? Like, do they think what they care about the, what the media says, this, that, and whatever. The, uh, the 2K ratings came out today for, uh, for 2K22 came out on Wednesday and dudes are upset. And unlike sometimes I think when, you know, they, they posture at the media or say this or that or whatever, when guys don't like their 2K ratings, I 100% believe them that they are pissed and they oh, are I, absolutely irritated by it. Absolutely. The the top 10 on 2K this coming season. Number one, LeBron James from the Los Angeles Lakers, your Los Angeles Lakers with a 96 overall, followed by Kevin Durant also with a 96 overall. I guess LeBron just has a somewhat better 96 than Durant's because clearly they're not going alphabetically. Giannis has another 96, followed by Steph at 96. Then you got Kawhi, Nikola Jokic, and Embiid at 95, followed by Luka, James Harden, and Damian Lillard at 94. Uh, Kevin Durant has made it clear that he thinks he should have had a 99. LeBron chimed in on Twitter saying that both Durant and Steph should have had 99s. You, you know, it's funny. We, you, we were talking offline uh, a bit about how Every year, ESPN does their hashtag NBA rank thing that causes a whole bunch of controversy that, you know, the only reason you even do this thing in the first place is to gin up that controversy. You and I know because we used to reluctantly have to do those write-ups and we couldn't stand them. But players will sometimes take umbrage with that. You know, Kobe gave Dave McMenamin, our buddy over at ESPN, shit for many years because of a rating that... Uh, that was, Kobe I mean, that it. was really Kobe more than anyone, I think. Pay, then that's, you know, and that's what I think, just for me, that almost colors, like, how I try to... I try to remember that not every player is Kobe because Kobe was so famously irritated by some of these rankings, particularly ones that came out after he was injured and he wasn't the same guy. But the rankings weren't that far off <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, but, you know, like there was a year like Kobe was like 22nd or something coming off the Achilles or, you know. Off Nobody had even seen him Achilles. play. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> like, like it was, it was, ex I mean, and he was just. Yeah, that, that was know, one of the years myth. he took this out on Dave so badly. Again, Dave had nothing to do with this. But we were talking before, like, what do you think players care more about, the 2K rating or hashtag NBA rank? What should they care more about, 2K rating, hashtag NBA rank? We both agreed it is 2K rating that they care more about and should care more about. That is far more a part of the actual NBA culture than the stupid ESPN rankings. Well, the ESPN rankings or any other tier. Yeah. So, first of all, Andy, they're in a video game. Yes. Like if you're in a video game, you you would want your your presence in that game to be as good as possible. Like if I'm in a video game, I want to be a 99 or 98 or 97. If I suck, I want I it's like I want I want it to be as good as possible. I do think it's interesting, like how you know they they compare to each other, and then also you know they just the the raw number. You know Trey Young got an 89, I guess you know, gets docked for his defense, <laughs> I guess. You know what? Um, in the last few years, I'm not even kidding. 2K has put more of an emphasis on defense, I think, both in the ratings, but also in the stuff that the players can actually do. So mm -hmm. I guess defense counts. The flip side is Trey Young is literally a video game. That should be worth a 90. Right. Like, and you don't want to make him higher than a 90, fine, but that's a 90. Right. And I think, like, that's one of those deals where you're like, come on. And, you know, he, he tweeted out about it or whatever. And I, I don't think, like, Luca, for example, is steaming that he's a 94 and Jokic is a 95 or something like that. I think they all wonder where the points get taken away. I mean, like, if you're LeBron and you're a 96, like, what is the dig? <laughs> like, is 
He's a decent outside shooter now. I mean, if you're Giannis and you're 96, like you got to be sitting there wondering, going like, what is exactly is the problem? If you just you know, 2K becomes at that point like that teacher that that everybody had in high school that just refused to give like a 98 or well, a 99 I mean, look, on an essay. Let's be honest. That's like everybody of- starts at a 94, 95, 96. Like I just won't give a 97, 98, 99. Like that's right, basically but- if LeBron or Giannis can't have it, then nobody can. Well, I mean, look, or that, is, that is in part the grift. I mean, I, I guarantee that if you go inside the inner workings of 2K when they are creating these ratings, you know, they know that there's only been a handful of active 99 uh, rated players, you know, in the game. Uh, Kevin Garnett was one of them. Kobe was one of them. Duncan, LeBron, Chris Paul. Shaq one year was a 100. I think the only guy to ever do that. As an active player, uh, post-retirement, MJ, Magic, Kareem have been 99s. But they know that that 99 is a holy grail, and therefore you know, they're, they're holding it over all these players' heads as something for them to get pissed about, something for fans to get pissed about. It's all one big game. It is, though, I, it's weird to say this, it is actually impressive to me that LeBron, after all these years, can still be the number one 2K player, A, because it just speaks to where he is in his career. B, like by now, you would think like the animators would be bored with him. Like they've they've just been doing LeBron for so many damn years. He'd be docked down to like a 95 just because they're sick of him. It's like you look at this and, you know, do I think LeBron is absolutely the best player night in, night out in the NBA anymore? No, probably not just because, you know, he, he, he... I think there is some somewhat of a limitation now on on how hard he can do it on both sides of the ball. I think Giannis is a better 82 game player now than LeBron. But it is, I mean, it is a reminder. Just like what year are we going in? Like uh, I believe it's his 19th season. 19th season. Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, I we were when when we were doing uh, TV last week. We, we were both on Spectrum Sports at the Lakers uh, local TV station, and they were putting up the the bona fides of the of the big three. And you look at it, and you're like Russell Westbrook, like All NBA seven times. I think it said. It's like, damn, that's a lot. Seven times you get to LeBron, it was seventeen or something insane <laughs> like that. Like it. Th- it's gotten to a point, and Kobe went through this to some degree, where like the, you know, like with the scoring, for example, it was so, the the numbers were so large and so prodigious and the, the accomplishments were so impressive that you kind of become numb, numb to them. Like Le, the, the idea that LeBron can credibly be called the best player in the NBA even if you or don't even agree. the video game version of the NBA. <laughs> right, the video game version of the NBA or the actual, either one. Um, you know, other people disagree. Most people probably say, you know, Durant, Giannis, whatever. But again, year 19 we're going into, and you can make a credible argument for the guy as the best player in the NBA. It is insane. I, it's absolutely insane. The guy, he could have won an MVP last year yeah. if Solomon Hill keeps, you know, minds his own business um, and before, does is not quite so aggro. Uh, before um, we go, it is, Brian, it is amazing to me. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And again, LeBron takes us seriously, just like all these guys do. Um, I don't want to beat a dead horse because we've talked a lot about Schroeder and, you know, ultimately what ended up happening him with him. Well, was Schroeder offered in 85 and decided it wasn't good enough? And- <laughs> he, he poorly negotiated his 2K rating. Ends up with a 73. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what, what happened here? Um, look, we've talked about before whether or not it was a good idea to pursue Schroeder in the first place, whether or not, you know, the Lakers ultimately mismanaged assets uh, with him ultimately – Walking away for nothing. You and I thought both at a certain point uh, they should let him walk, uh, just to make that clear. But um, the Lakers uh, for me, did... it was after they traded for Russell Westbrook. <laughs> Look, that, <laughs> that's really when it became uh, obvious. I, I don't want to beat a dead horse on this, but the Lakers did allow the top ranked German player to just walk out the door with no compensation. Dennis Schroeder is a 79. Next closest to him is Daniel Tice with a okay. 76. I was, I was so. Tice is a 76. What's Kleba? Uh, he is a 76 as well. 
If somebody the somewhere is like, look, you don't pay $84 million for a 79. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Oh, but you know what? All joking aside, Ben Simmons' rating is at an 84. It is, I believe, down from an 86 or 87 the previous year. For the Sixers who are trying to move the guy, that doesn't help. Like It, it does not help. You know, Somebody probably, in a front it, office somewhere will take it too seriously. Right. It probably doesn't. Um, all right. Uh, Jeannie Buss had some interesting things to say about uh, the NBA's play-in tournament, particularly that Andy and I uh, thought were kind of reflective of where the Lakers are, who they are, and how they operate. We'll do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Sweat Block. There are a few things in life just not fun to talk about, to address, to acknowledge, and one of them is excessive sweating. Like if you are sweating through your clothes head to toe, no particular reason, not even that hot outside. It is really humiliating. You don't have to worry about it. So that's why I use sweat block antiperspirant wipes. Sweat block stronger, more effective than most clinical antiperspirants. Just apply it at night before you go to bed next morning. Wake up, wash, you pig, and then go about your day without worrying about any sweat whatsoever. Use it once or twice a week. A week. Stay dry the whole time. Guaranteed or your money back. No more pit stains. No more picking out clothes based on what's going to hide that excessive gross sweat better. I mean, you don't have to deal with that anymore. And I'll put it this way. If you know a sweat solution that is doctor created, doctor recommended, featured on Rachel Ray's show, tested by firefighters, I'm listening. But until then, check out Sweatblock. Get it today, 20% off at sweatblock.com using the promo code Locked On or at Amazon and CVS. Uh, Locked On Liquor is also brought to you by Theragun. It's the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using, using a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power. Um, it is phenomenal. Um, I have yeah. one of these things. I've had one long before we started doing the, you know these reads and you know working for the network and all that. Uh, my wife got one uh, that we share. It is so useful. Uh, it doesn't just feel good. It gets to the source of the pain. This is the Theragun generation, uh, Gen 4 Theragun. I don't have that one. Uh, and this one's even, and the one I'm talking about, the Gen 4 is even better. It gets to the source of the pain by releasing tension using uh, that that signature percussive therapy goes 60% deeper than vibration alone. So whether you want to treat muscle tension from working out, an injury, or just the stress of daily life, like Lord knows if you've got kids, your shoulders are all haunchy all the time. Um, Theragun Gen 4. It, Not my kid, release, Brian. My kid's perfect. Yeah. Uh, well, you're, it will release all of that stuff. Um, Theragun's trusted by 250 professional sports teams like Real Madrid and elite, elite athletes like Paul George, Boo, uh, DeAndre Hopkins, Maria Sharapova, thousands of other customers. People like Andy's got one too. Yeah, they really do. Fantastic. They like legit work great. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, you know, beat down all your muscle uh, tension. So go to Theragun. Try Theragun for 30 days, uh, starting at only one hundred ninety nine dollars. Go to therabody.com slash locked on right now. Get your Gen Four Theragun today. That's therabody.com slash locked on. Therabody.com slash locked on. So Jeannie Buss was uh, in The Athletic, or quoted in The Athletic. Um, she actually participated in a story about Alex Spanos, I guess part of the, uh, the family of uh, children of owners who now uh, run teams. And so um, the, you know, Dean Spanos with the Chargers. And so uh, one of the questions that came up that was kind of interesting was related to the play-in game. She she was asked about the play-in format and whether she liked it, and her answer was no, um, for two reasons. First, Andy, she said she just thinks it's sort of generally unfair to teams that finish sort of in the top. If you're a team that's in the top, you know, eight all season, you're seven, you're eight, and all of a sudden you could find yourself out of the playoffs. It happened to the Warriors last year, for example. Um, and then she didn't like it because she thinks it's a bad way to combat tanking. Um, Let's do the first part first, I guess. Like, she's not wrong that the play in is sort of unfair. If you're a team that's solidly in the seven seed all year long, um, it is a little bit unfair, right? Yeah. Look, it's in a lot of ways supposed to be unfair. And I think the yeah. unfairness is what ultimately creates the tension that makes it exciting because you are perhaps watching a team in real time that's been reasonably good throughout the regular season get screwed you know be, yeah, you're because, because you're trying to generate more excitement for the season as a whole and by the way it's done its job there has absolutely been more engagement 
last season and certainly, you know, the play in during the bubble, that stuff was really exciting. People really got into it and it does cre- it does create more reasons to watch more teams over the course of an entire 82 game season than you otherwise would knowing that, you know, a 9 seed or a 10 seed, certainly an 11 seed is basically out of it by the and end of March. And even more than think of all the, the excitement that was generated just on the question of whether or not the Lakers are going to find themselves in the play-in yeah. tournament. Because when that happens, it opens the door to the possibility, as Jeannie says, that they could lose two games and be out of it. The whole thing worked phenomenally well. And so, like, you know, she even, you know, she acknowledges it's exciting. Well, the, um, the other and, thing too, and, and that's I would just and finish up, like that's that's it. Like that's the whole thing. Cause it not only does it generate interest in you know, spots, you know, 11, you know, 10, nine, those fans are still engaged. It also keeps people interested in what's happening at five, six, and seven. Those teams are, are, are jockeying for different stuff. It puts a, you know, so you have these layers now of what's going on with the playoff race, whether it's home court, whether it's, you know, staying out of the play in tournament, whether it's getting into the play in tournament. Um, it, it was it was a, a massive success, and so it's not going anywhere. And you know that part's not surprising. Yeah, I mean, look, if we're really being transparent about it, the league has an issue with maintaining excitement, not just for the, those middle to lower seeds. You know that we're talking about. You know, some reason to keep watching. You know, a ten seed in April. They've been having difficulty generating excitement for the entire regular season period. Mm-hmm. Even when you start talking about some of the upper seeds, like, you know, the, the number one seeds over the course of the year, like there is a perception that the NBA season is too long. And to be perfectly honest, I think in a lot of ways it is too long. The world has changed a lot and your entertainment options have changed a lot. Your content options have changed a lot since an 82 game season was, you know, incepted. But you have, you have to find ways that might feel like gimmickry which frankly this is in order to keep that that interest going. It is, but it's 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 it's, 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 it's gimmickry until it's been around for ten sure. years and twelve. Yeah. Then it just becomes normal. Right now, it still feels a little gimmicky, but um, it it works beautifully for exactly what you're talking about and generating that interest. The other part of it, though, is the 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 anti tanking uh, as you know the the play in as an anti tanking device. Um, which it is also effective in in the sense that you know more teams have the opportunity to try to get into a playoff, if not the playoffs. Um, the playoffs are a tremendous financial incentive uh, for teams to get in. There's generally a belief that you know it's good to make the playoffs. So if you can do it, it's better to it's better to have you know the 16th pick and be in the playoffs than the 13th pick. And I like at some point, you know. And the league has done a pretty good job, I think, of, of disincentivizing just flat out tanking by flattening the lottery odds. But she made the comment that she believes that, you know, as a device for stopping tanking, they'd be better off giving up draft picks, like penalizing teams that tank in actual draft picks. Getting past the idea of, I have no idea how you would police that. Like, who gets to decide whether a team is tanking or just terrible? Um, there, I mean, it, it is reflective of a of an organization that view that uses the draft very, very differently than most of the rest of the league. Right. I mean, look, you, that is the perspective of a have team versus a have not team. Yes. Because you know she she's either talking about the the idea of raising a financial punishment for tanking, which, as you said, is basically unenforceable. The the Oklahoma City Thunder. Would be in hawk by now if you actually could do something like that. Because yeah, they spent you, the last reason like actually announcing to people at the beginning of a game, folks, we are not trying to win. There are no penalties for for tanking. Right. Or she's talking about, you know, just like the finan- the financial disincentive, like you were saying before, of not making the playoffs. But this is a, this is an organization that has not needed to put that type of premium on building through the draft mm-hmm. because you know they've had, they've had this combination of prestige location history some luck and also a lot of really really well run years really well run organization you know really well run front offices they haven't had to use the draft in the same way i mean like the the last several years that we've even seen them put any type of premium on 
draft picks at all and, and building young players, A, they were all ended up a package for Anthony Davis. B, those were lottery picks they weren't even trying to get. They, well, they, certainly, those... they certainly weren't tanking and they were yeah. trying to avoid being in the lottery. No, they were inexplicably chasing eight seeds with a hobbled Kobe because the, basically they felt like we can't do that, even though the most pragmatic approach would be acknowledging where you are and actually yeah. you know, putting a premium on those type of players. They, they threw no planning of their own, ended up getting those lottery picks that played a big role in putting them in the position that they are right now. But it's just, it's not something that they've really ever had to do before. You still can't convince me the league didn't help them with that. Um, I've been but saying the, that for years. But the... But it's. It, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a more, Andy. I think that it's the 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 purpose of those draft picks as they were making them through the the lean years, as we call them, were it was it was almost always in the context of what can we use these young players to go get? Mm-hmm. Like you know, oh, yeah. it, it is it is the same basic, and it's not a criticism. It's just you know, it's it served them well. They've won seventeen titles, uh, but particularly in the sort of star free agency era. Um, I'm not talking about Showtime. They drafted Worthy. They drafted Magic. I get all that. But since then, you know, it's it's Kobe. And Kobe, basically. <laughs> I mean, that, that in terms of, you know, maybe for a, a stretch of time, it looked like Andrew Bynum might be one of those guys. Um, but, you know, and they, they were smart to move him when they did. But you know the, the the young players that they had were almost always spoken of in the context of, you know, these are the players that will get us a superstar. You know, hopefully, you know, it would have been great if they if they evolved into one themselves. You know, I always wonder. We're actually going to do this a little bit. You know, maybe sort of a, uh, the the what if game. We may do some some podcasts. We put the question out there to to, to listeners. You know, some of the great Lakers what ifs. One of my favorites is what if they take Jason Tatum. Uh, in the draft, you know, a guy who kind of developed a little quicker into um, that sort of star in waiting status. Like, what does that do in that whole rebuilding era? But it was always, other than we know that he'd be playing in New Orleans right now, it was always, it's all, those guys are always done in the, what can we do to, to, to get a star? Uh, yeah. I mean, so for- it, was, it was interesting to hear Jeannie kind of articulate that without saying it explicitly. Yeah, I mean, for all the Lakers' ability and really commendable ability to select players very well in the draft over the last decade or so, they've never been truly committed towards developing them. It's just, it's not who they are. They are, Don't need they're, to. yeah, they're, they are not a build it from the ground organization, which is fine. It's worked very well for them, but it does, ex- it does explain and reveal a lot about why Jeannie would feel that way about tanking drafting in general and all that stuff. It was really interesting. Yeah. Um, let's open up the mailbag. An interesting question about postseason awards and what the Lakers might be uh, looking at this season. We'll do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar ever covered in 100% chocolate. They are soft. They are easy to chew. They are healthy. They're great for health conscious people. If you're trying to lose or maintain weight while indulging in something that tastes awesome, low calorie, low sugar, high protein, high fiber. They're great for the keto folks and they taste awesome. You've got the 12 original flavors like raspberry, coconut almond, salted caramel, banana bread, new flavors, including cherry barcia, lemon almond cheesecake, cookies and cream. Awesome taste combinations. You get something new and different every time. You never feel like you're just getting bored eating the same thing over and over and over for your snacks. So go to BuiltBar.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You get 15% off your first order. Again, promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. Locked on Lakers also brought to you by Bet Online, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Baseball season. We're getting near the stretch run, Andy. You can track all the action at Bet Online. Uh, so the latest news, odds, info for baseball, uh, the NBA, now that the, that the schedules are coming out and all that stuff, that's going to be firing up soon. UFC, MMA, you can do all that there. Uh, before the next pitch, head over to Bet Online on your laptop or your mobile device. Check out everything you need. Sign-up bonuses included 50% off, uh, 50%, I should say, welcome bonus on your first deposit. 
um, when you use the promo code locked on again, you go to the website or your mobile device and you sign up, you receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. When you use the promo code locked on, don't sit on the sidelines. This is your chance to get into the game as uh, baseball gets ready for its runs to the playoffs. You do all that at bet online, your online sports book experts. All right, so we put out another call for the mailbag. Uh, you can hit us up on Twitter at Cam Brothers. You can also hit us up on email, Brothers gmail.com or the iTunes show page. Uh, hint, if you leave a five-star review with your question, the odds precipitously go up that we will actually use it. Four stars or less, take your chances, um, and your chances suck. But anyway, from the Nathan Mark um, on Twitter, if the Lakers are the number one seed again this season, Will it finally be the year the Lakers actually win some year ends awards, especially Vogel and Palinka? Um, it's really interesting, Brian, because no. in a lot of these. No. Really? <laughs> nope. You really don't think so? Nope. I, I actually, think the Lakers are in line for one, one which potential is? postseason award, MVP. Really? Anthony Davis could win MVP, LeBron James could win MVP. I do not think Frank Vogel will win Coach of the Year. I do not think Rob Palenka will win Executive of the Year. Rob has a better chance than Frank, but I don't think either one of them are particularly good good odds. That's actually interesting because I think, ironically, in the year that the Lakers created a super team, a few of these guys actually may have their best shots, um, particularly Vogel and Rob Palenka. The reason with, uh, with Frank Vogel, I'll start with him, is the perception that this team is so defensively vulnerable, not without some reason. I mean, certainly on paper, it's more defensively vulnerable than any team in the LeBron AD era. That's been the overriding narrative. You and I have talked about it before. LeBron, you know, he can still defend really well when he's engaged, like we saw in the last half of the season, but he's getting up there in age. There's concerns about his health. Same thing goes with Anthony Davis. They lost two of their best defenders in KCP and Alex Caruso. Solid one in Kuzma. Schroeder was more effective than I expected. Even Drummond. Andre Drummond was actually solid defensively for all the clunkiness uh, that could be there offensively with them. Russell Westbrook's considered a minus defender. And then you've got a bunch of new guys that, other than Kent Bazemore, are considered somewhere to neutral to minus or like Trevor Reza, Dwight Howard. They garner some respect, but they're like back ends of their careers. Marcus Saul is more of a situational defender at this point. We've talked about that. Pretty good. I mean, those three guys are all really still pretty, you know, great out very well, but they're also all 58 years old. So, right. I mean, there, there is, though, I think a, w- these narratives get set very, very early on. And mm-hmm. there is a narrative right now that the front office very rightly decided the offense had to get goosed at all costs. And if this team is top 10, top five defensively, Frank Vogel will actually break through this year and, and break through what often is just being considered the extension of LeBron, who really is the coach. The reason you're wrong is that for all of those things that you're talking about, the Lakers are going to almost certainly be the overwhelming favorite to win the West. Um, you know, defensive questions aside, fit questions aside, all of that stuff the Lakers are going to be the prohibitive favorites to win the Western Conference. I don't think, you know, we, we haven't really gotten deep into the other teams. We talked about it, was it on, thir- on, on yesterday's show, I should say. Today's Thursday's show. But yesterday's show with the Suns or the earlier this week, like the Suns are as good of a team as the conference has. And, and I think the Lakers would have beaten them last year. And I would pick the Lakers to beat them right now. I would pick them to win uh, a series over the Suns this year. Denver doesn't have Jamal Murray. The Clippers don't. When you start to go down the line, the Clip, the Lakers, even if you have questions about them, are going to be the prohibitive favorites in the West. When that happens, you almost never see the coach of that team win a postseason award. If things go reasonably according to plan for the Lakers, Frank Vogel's not going to win Coach of the Year because there's going to be some team that goes from seventh in the conference to second somewhere, or you know does what Monty Williams did last year with the Suns or any of that stuff, and that's going to be much more attention. It's not fair, but that's that's just how that award is given out. 
No, I understand Palenka, that. But I just I think Palinka is a better. I mean, I'm, I, I all, the, all everything you said is compelling as to why Vogel might have a better shot this year than another one. But if the Lakers are picked to win the conference and they're expected to win between fifty five and sixty games or whatever it is that people put out there um, or whatever the number might be. Frank Vogel's not going to win coach of the year. And I, it's again, it's not fair, but no, but I, 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 I under, has I got a better shot because he would have put together essentially a brand new team. And the Westbrook deal isn't like the Davis deal where it's like you and I could have made the, 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 the Davis deal. It's just keep doing stuff until somebody, until David Griffin says, yes, you know, we could make the Westbrook deal too. But I'm not sure anybody would have. <laughs> and so well, but, okay, but, if they but win that's for why. that and it turns out to be a good deal and something that really helps them and it plays out well, and then you look at the other players around, um, I think Rob's got a better chance than Vogel does, except I still don't think people like Rob very much inside the league. Okay. Well, no, I, I think that definitely that is hurt him. That, that definitely is an issue. Rob Palinka has, uh, from a lot of what we've heard and certainly observed, he's made some enemies over the years or certainly built up some resentment. He is definitely not a popular guy around the league. But what I think will get him a lot of credit is, as you were talking about before, there have been some doubts about the wisdom of going after Russell Westbrook. Mm -hmm. Like, the, you know, the idea that the Lakers in a lot of ways, made this more complicated than, you know, than certainly need be. Russell Westbrook, for all the upside that he potentially offers, he offers complications as well. And especially when they had the Buddy Heel deal by multiple, multiple reports on the table, ready to go, it would have been cleaner and easier, if not necessarily with the same ceiling. They opted to go for something that is more complicated. And then Palinka had to work some pretty impressive magic uh, with very little financial options, you know, only just league minimums and a taxpayer mid-level exception, built a pretty well-constructed team. And because of that, though, I think if this ends up much smoother than people expected, I think Palinka is actually going to get credit yeah. for seeing something that that's, other people That's what didn't. I was saying. But, but also, though, because... There were things that he saw that other people didn't, even though the Lakers, I think, will probably enter this season as the consensus favor to win the West. It's more going to be because Jamal Murray isn't there for Denver, because Kawhi Leonard isn't there for the Clippers, and somebody has to win the West, but I don't think they're going to be projected to win the West with the same type of confidence that they had the last couple years when people saw that coming. So Maybe. because of that, I think Vogel is actually going to get more credit this year if it runs relatively smooth from start to finish. And that defensive integrity that people are expecting to be an issue, you know, the mystery of what you do with Russell Westbrook and LeBron on the court at the same time, how do you find that balance? I think if that stuff comes through, you're going to see more exception to the rule and then in the meantime, the exact same narratives with LeBron, you know, look look at what he's doing at this age. There are only so many more years. You're going to have the opportunity to give him a fifth MVP. If it was there last year, it's going to be there this year. Oh, no, the MVP things, absolutely. I mean, I want I, I think if the Lakers win the West and you know LeBron has a you know plays 75 games and has a, I think there's an excellent chance he wins MVP. Um, because the story's too good. So just say it like I, you know. The irony of, I think, your presentation, and I actually would agree with this, the smoother things go, if it looks like the Westbrook deal really works and all that kind of stuff, and Vogel can kind of integrate this thing and it just kind of goes off without a hitch, I think that speaks to Rob's ability to win an executive award and lessens Frank's ability to win. If it doesn't fit very well, and you, know, you can see Vogel coaching his ass off, it's going to prevent Rob from winning something but it's going to make it much easier for Frank. So uh, the the the, um, the 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 more smooth things are with Russ um, is going to determine any chances. I think that either one of these guys has to win anything, but I don't think either one of them will. Um, keep the uh, what if suggestions coming. We we got this idea um, from the the folks that locked on Mavs who did a couple of interesting hypotheticals on their podcast. Um, and then Carmelo Anthony was actually talking about hypotheticals, whether or not he'd been drafted by Detroit as opposed to by Denver, um, which created some interesting uh, chatter on the uh, on basketball Twitter on Thursday and uh, Wednesday into Thursday. So 
Uh, yeah, he was on the Elvis coming Smoke to us. podcast. Yeah, keep those coming to us on uh, at Cam Brothers, uh, Cam and Esky Brothers, gmail.com. Same way as you send in all the uh, stuff for the mailbag. And so that's going to be an upcoming episode. We're looking forward to that. Uh, some more good interviews coming as well. And so we will see everybody on Friday.